Well, here's our story for writing this week. And you may think that's odd that we're going to read another story today for our writing. But this story has to do with what we're going to be writing about eventually. Remember, our theme is what makes us who we are. And so this story is called La Mariposa. That's that Spanish word for butterfly, remember? It's written by a man named Francisco Jimenez. And this story is a little bit about his life. He's taking real events that happened in his life, and he's given them a little bit of a fictional twist. But this is realistic fiction is the genre of this story. Parts of it are real, but some parts are added to make it fictional or not real. So this is kind of a long story. So make yourself comfortable. Sit back somewhere where you're comfortable. And I'm going to read this story to you. We'll talk about it as we go. All right, here we go. La Mariposa. Remember, it has lots of Spanish words. This is the dedication page. We're going to go on to our story. Early mo Monday morning, Francisco got up to get ready. Quickly, he pulled on his overalls, which he hated because he thought the suspenders made him look foolish. But he found the soft, bright flannel shirt Mama had just bought at the Goodwill store. And then he put on his favorite cap. Quitatela in la clase, his older brother Roberto warned him. Remember, that means you can't wear a hat in class? For he'd been to school before and he knew it was bad manners to wear a hat in class. Gracias, Francisco told him, taking it off. But after his breakfast and just before heading out, he decided to wear the cap. Papa always wore one, and how could Francisco feel dressed for first grade without it, without it? He would remember to take it off in class. Adios, Mama, Francisco and Roberto called as they headed out to catch the school bus. Adios, hijos. Goodbye, boys, she answered. Que Dios los bandiga. May God bless you. Papa had already left to thin lettuce the only work he could find in late January. Mama stayed home to take care of little Jose and to set up their new home in Tent City. Wow, look at what they're living in. They're living in tents, aren't they? Do you live in a tent? <laughs> you might go camping sometimes, but this family is living in a tent. So what does that tell us? Maybe we can infer from that maybe they're poor. Let's read on and find out. When the school bus arrived, Francisco took the window seat next to his brother so that he could watch the rows of lettuce and cauliflower go whizzing by. He thought the furrows looked like giant legs running alongside. The bus kept stopping to pick up kids, and with each stop, the noise inside grew louder. Some kids were yelling at the top of their lungs. Francisco didn't know what, did not know what they were saying because he could speak only Spanish. And they were all speaking English. He was getting a headache. Roberto had his eyes closed and was frowning. Francisco did not disturb him. He figured his brother was getting a headache too. When they got to school, Roberto walked Francisco to the principal's office. Mr. Sims, the principal, was a tall red-headed man who listened patiently to Roberto. My little brother, Roberto said, using the little English he knew, is in primer grado. Remember, it means he's in first grade. Mr. Sims walked Francisco to the first grade classroom. As soon as he saw the bright electric lights, shiny wood floor, and warm heater in the corner, Francisco liked the room. It was not at all like his family's green army tent with its hard dirt floor. Why does he like the classroom? It's got electricity and a wood floor and a warm heater. Remember, it's January, so maybe their little tent with a dirt floor is cold. So he likes this room. Mr. Sims introduced Francisco to his teacher, Miss Scalapino, who smiled and repeated his name, Francisco. It was the only word Francisco understood the whole time she and the principal talked. They repeated it each time they glanced at him. After Miss Sims left, Mr. Sims left, she showed Francisco to his desk at the end of the row of desks closest to the windows. There were no other kids in the room. Francisco sat at his desk and ran his hand over its wooden top. 
It was full of scratches and dark ink spots. He lifted the top, and inside were a box of crayons, a yellow ruler, and a thick pencil. Looking around the room, he saw under the window, right next to his desk, a caterpillar in a large jar. It was yellowish green with black bands, and it moved very slowly without making any sound. Hmm. I wonder what that caterpillar's got to do with La Mariposa. You have any guesses? Just as Francisco was about to reach into the jar to gently touch the caterpillar, the bell rang. Kids lined up outside the classroom doorway and then walked in quietly and took their seats. Some of them looked at Francisco and giggled. They made him nervous. He turned his head away from them and looked at the caterpillar in the jar. He did this every time someone looked at him. Miss Scalapino started speaking to the class, and Francisco did not understand the word she said. The more she spoke, the more Francisco wanted to be at home. He tried to pay attention because he wanted to understand, but by the end of the day, he got very tired of hearing Miss Scalapino talk because the sounds still made no sense to him. He got a bad headache, and that night when he went to bed, he heard her voice in his head. Why are those sounds she's making make, making no sense to him? He doesn't understand English, does he? He speaks Spanish. For days, Francisco tried to listen, but he always went home with a bad headache until he learned a way out. When his head began to hurt from trying to understand, he let his mind wander. Sometimes he imagined himself flying out of the classroom and over the fields where Papa worked. Have you ever imagined you could fly? Hola, Papa, he would say, landing next to him. But Francisco was careful not to let the teacher catch him thinking about flying. He would look at the teacher and pretend he was listening. Papa had told him it was disrespectful not to pay attention especially to grown-ups. When the teacher spoke the children's names, though, Francisco would listen. He liked their sound. Molly sounded like mole in Spanish, and Pat sounded like pato. The one he learned first was Curtis, because Curtis was the biggest and most popular kid in the class. He was always chosen captain when the kids formed teams. Francisco was the smallest kid in class, and he did not know English, so he was chosen last. Francisco liked Arthur better. Arthur was one of the boys who knew a little Spanish. During recess, they would play on the swings, and Francisco would pretend to be a Mexican movie star, like Jorge Negrete or Pedro Infante, riding a horse and singing the corridos he heard on the car radio. He taught the songs to Arthur as they swung back and forth, going as high as they could. Sounds like Arthur is Francisco's friend. I'm glad he's got a friend. But if Miss Scalapino heard them speaking Spanish, she would say no with her whole body. Her head turned left and right a hundred times a second, and her index finger moved from side to side as fast as a windshield wiper. English, English, she repeated. Arthur avoid Fran avoided Francisco whenever she was around. Often during recess, Francisco stayed with the caterpillar. Sometimes it was hard to spot him because he blended in with the green leaves and twigs. Every day, Francisco brought him leaves from the pepper trees that grew on the playground. Just in front of the caterpillar, lying on top of the cabinet, was a picture book of caterpillars and butterflies. Francisco liked to look through it page by page, studying all the pictures and running his fingers lightly over the caterpillars and the bright wings of the butterflies and the many patterns on them. He knew caterpillars turned into butterflies because Roberto had told him. But just how did they do it? How long did it take? The words written underneath each picture in big black letters could tell him he knew, so he tried to figure them out by looking at the pictures. He did this so many times he could close his eyes and see the words, but he still could not understand what they meant. Now, why is he not understanding what he's reading? The words are in English and he speaks Spanish. How would that feel? How would you feel if you couldn't understand your teacher's language? Or if you tried to read a book, but you couldn't read the words? That would be frustrating and it would make you sad, wouldn't it? I bet Francisco's feeling pretty frustrated. By the time Papa started topping carrots in March, 
Art had become Francisco's favorite time at school. He did not understand Miss Scalapino when she explained the art lessons, so she let him do whatever he wanted. He drew all kinds of animals, but mostly birds and butterflies. He sketched them in pencil and then colored them, using every color in his crayon box. He got pretty good at drawing butterflies. Miss Scalapino even tacked one of his pictures up on the board for everyone to see. After a couple of weeks, it disappeared, and he did not know how to ask where it had gone. One cold Thursday morning during recess, Francisco was the only kid on the playground without a jacket. The principal must have noticed that he was shivering because after school he took him to his office and pulled out a green jacket from a large cardboard box full of used clothes. He handed it to Francisco and gestured for him to try it on. It smelt like graham crackers. Francisco put it on, but it was too big, so he rolled up the sleeves about two inches. Then he took it home and showed it off to his parents. He liked it because it was green and it hid his suspenders. The next day, Francisco wore his new jacket to school. He was on the playground waiting for the first bell to ring when he saw Curtis coming at him like an angry bull. Curtis aimed his head at Francisco, pulled his arms straight back with his hands clenched, and ran up to him yelling. Francisco did not understand him, but he knew it had something to do with the jacket because Curtis began to pull it, pull on it, trying to take it off. Next thing Francisco knew, he and Curtis were on the ground wrestling. Kids circled around them. He could hear them yelling Curtis's name and something else. Francisco knew he had no chance. Curtis was so much bigger and stronger, but he held on tight to his jacket. Why should he let him take it? Curtis pulled on one of the sleeves so hard that it ripped at the shoulder. He pulled on the right pocket and it ripped too. Poor Francisco, he's having a bad day. Here's a picture of him. Big old Curtis on top of him, the big bully. Why is he trying to take his jacket? Then Miss Scalapino's face appeared above them. She pushed Curtis off of Francisco, grabbed Francisco by the back of his collar, and picked him up off the ground. It took all the power he had not to cry. Later, Arthur told Francisco in Spanish that Curtis said the jacket was his, that he had lost it at the beginning of the year. He also told Francisco that the teacher said Curtis and he were being punished. They had to sit on the bench during all the recesses that week. For the rest of the day, Francisco could not even pretend he was paying attention. He laid his head on top of his desk and closed his eyes. He couldn't even imagine himself flying over the fields to Papa anymore. The teacher called his name, but Francisco did not answer. He heard her walk up to him. She gently shook him by the shoulders. Again, he did not answer. Miss, Miss Scalapino must have thought he was dead asleep because she left him alone, even when it was time for recess and everyone left the room. Once the room was quiet, Francisco slowly opened his eyes he had them closed for so long that the sunlight coming through the windows was too bright. He rubbed his eyes with the back of his hands and then looked for the caterpillar in the jar. Where was it? Was it hidden? He put his hand in the jar and lightly stirred the leaves. And then he saw it. The caterpillar had spun itself into a cocoon. It had attached itself to a small twig and now it looked like a tiny cotton bulb. Gently, Francisco stroked it with his index finger. It seemed so peaceful. At the end of the school day, Miss Scalapino gave Francisco a note to take home to his parents. Papa and Mama did not know how to read, but as soon as they saw his swollen upper lip and the scratches on his cheek, they knew what the note said. When he told them what happened, they both frowned and glared at him. Papa finally said, but it's good you didn't respect disrespect the teacher. Francisco never saw the green jacket again. It had gone back to Curtis, who didn't wear it anymore because the days were growing warmer. Francisco never spoke to Curtis, but slowly he began to say a few words, a few English words like thank you and okay to Arthur and the other kids and sometimes to his teacher. On Wednesday, May 23rd, a few days before the end of the school year, Miss Scalapino told everyone to sit down. Then Francisco did not understand any more of what she said until he heard her say Francisco as she held up a blue ribbon. From her desk, she picked up his drawing of the butterfly that had disappeared from the board so many weeks before. 
Holding it up high for everyone to see, she walked up to Francisco and handed him the drawing and the blue silk ribbon that had number one printed on it in gold. Que sorpresa! What a surprise! He'd received first prize for his drawing. He was so proud he wanted to run home right away to tell Papa and Mama. All the other kids, including Curtis, rushed over to see his ribbon. That afternoon, during free period, Francisco went over to check on the caterpillar. He turned the jar around, trying to see the cocoon. Then he gasped. It was beginning to crack open. Look, look, he cried out, pointing to it. The whole class, like a swarm of bees, rushed over to the counter. Miss Scalapino took the jar and placed it on top of a desk in the middle of the classroom so everyone could see it. For a while, they all stood there watching the butterfly come out of its cocoon in slow motion like magic. At the end of the day, just before the last bell, Miss Scalapino picked up the jar and took the class outside of the playground. She placed the jar on the ground and everyone circled around. Francisco had a hard time seeing over the other kids, so Miss Scalapino called him and motioned for him to open the jar. Breaking through the circle, he knelt on the ground and unscrewed the top. Swiftly, the butterfly flew into the air, fluttering its orange and black wings up and down. Que hermosa! How beautiful, Francisco said, but softly, underneath his breath, so no one would hear him speak Spanish. Miss Scalapino must have heard, though. Que hermosa, she repeated, smiling down at Francisco. How beautiful. After school, Francisco waited in line for his bus in front of the playground. In his right hand, he carried the blue ribbon, and in his left, the drawing. Arthur and Curtis came up and stood behind him to wait for their bus. Curtis motioned for Francisco to show him the drawing again. He held it up so Curtis could see it. He really likes it, Francisco, Arthur said to him in Spanish. How do you say estuyo in English, he said, he asked Arthur. It's yours, Arthur answered. It's yours, Francisco repeated, and handed the drawing to Curtis. Well, how nice. After Curtis stole his jacket, Francisco's being nice and giving the picture to, of the butterfly to Curtis. And that's the end of the story. What did you think? Well, there was a lot of experiences about Francis that happened to Francisco in this story, wasn't there? Think about where he lives. His home is different from everybody else. Think about his language. His language is different from everyone else's. He doesn't have a jacket like everyone else. He probably felt very different. But... At the, in the end of the story, he felt comfortable and he even won a prize and was nice enough to give the class bully his picture of a butterfly. Now, what do you think that butterfly symbolizes? Let's talk about symbolism for a minute. I'm going to make my picture bigger. Symbolism is something that stands for something else. So if you were to write something that said, I love you. Can you think of a symbol that you could put in place of the word love? How about a heart, right? I can't do it with my hands. You probably can. You could put a heart there. That would be a symbol of love. It would symbolize love, heartwood. Well, what do you think that butterfly symbolizes in the story? I think the butterfly symbolizes Francisco. Remember Francisco is... As he was thinking about, he just wanted to let his thoughts wonder, where would he go? He would fly where? Over the fields where his father was working. What else in the story flies? That's right, the butterfly flies. So I think as he thought about the caterpillar and thought about it turning into a butterfly, it kind of symbolizes Francisco being this little new student in class. And then he grows into somebody who wins a prize. And he turns into somebody new, like that caterpillar turned into a butterfly. So that story has a lot of neat symbolism in it. I hope you enjoyed La Mariposa. We'll do something else in writing tomorrow. Think about your experiences in your life. Think about Francisco's and the things that happened to him that made him who he is. Think about your experiences that have made you who you are. We're going to be writing about it soon.